Mahaba, and hello to everyone. I'm Dr. Jack Dempsey, American writer and historian living in Crete. And with me is Mohammed Ihad Ishmael, a Palestinian writer and historian living in Deir al Bala, which is part of the Gaza territory. His family was driven there at gunpoint uh, back in 1948. And they have been living in that area as refugees ever since. He has, uh, well, Mohammed is a close friend of mine, I consider, I think almost a couple of years now. He has a beautiful family, beautiful young family that deserve to live the free lives of all human beings. And so Mohammed and I, as two ordinary people, just like to try to keep the discussions going about how to solve the terrible crisis between Israel and Palestine in the Near East. So Mohammed, once again, marhaba, hello, and welcome. And we have a number of topics to talk about today, including the terrible murder of the journalist Shireen Abu Akla, and some of the uh, winding up some of the thoughts about ancient Palestinian history that we've discussed here before. So how are you, Mohammed? How are things there in Gaza this week? We all know that they are living a constant crisis there in just about every way people can imagine. But I know that people are eager to hear from you. Thank you, brother. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I hope today we are going to make a good uh, program uh, telling uh, the people who are watching us about the latest uh, updates of Gaza, of Palestine, of what happened here in the Holy Land. Uh, the, the situation in Gaza, unfortunately, is very, very bad. Now, you know, we have uh, the beginning of uh, summer. Uh, as usual, as uh, each summer, we have a continuous crisis of electricity. Electricity is very, very uh, uh, critical these, the, these days. Unfortunately, uh, most of the day and the night, uh, we have no electricity and uh, we have very, very high temperature. So uh, the situation is very, very bad. In addition to that, we have uh, a crazy prices here in Gaza. Everything became so expensive. Uh, all the kinds of food, grains, cooking oil, uh, tomato past, uh, chicken, frozen uh, fish, flour, uh, corn, uh, etc. Everything is very, very expensive. Uh, to, to explain maybe, this, uh, to, to explain that problem in a very blunt way also, I mean, as you and I have discussed before, it has very much to do with two things. One, how little the Israeli authorities allow to be shipped into Gaza every day. There are two and a half million people there and they allow uh, 200, 250 trucks that leaves a mathematics of something like 12,000 people who are supposed to be able to survive and supply themselves off of one truck. So it can't be a surprise to anybody that these crises are still ongoing and still so terrible for you, your family, and the people of Gaza. Exactly. Also, the lands in Gaza are very limited. You know, Gaza is very, very narrow uh, strip of land. Yes. So even we haven't uh, an enough uh, lands just to plant wheat or other grains. You know, Gaza is crowded with, with uh, slums, with camps, with uh, uh, buildings. Uh, the free land is very, very rare. And we haven't uh, enough land to plant uh, food. So as you just mentioned, uh, the situation is very bad because Israel uh, is allowing a very few number of trucks to, uh, to come each day with food to Gaza. And I remember last winter, you were sharing with us that uh, Gaza territory had a pretty good year for a harvest of vegetables and some fruits because there had been a lot of rain. Of course, rain falls out of the sky. It is not the water that comes from the authorities there in Israel. Uh, so the shortages go on for, for two reasons. One is how little the Israelis allow in to supply Gaza. And then the second driving up the prices is that Hamas 
and other oligarchs uh, control the access of the people to the goods that come in. And they jack up the prices to apparently benefit themselves. So the people of Gaza are living under two kinds of tyranny, are they not? Yes, yes. Unfortunately, uh, we are suffering from both, from the local government here in Gaza and from the Israeli occupation. Also, we are suffering from PA in West Bank because they are putting uh, high taxes over us right now. So we pay three kinds of taxes, one, one for Hamas, second for PA, and the third for Israel. Can you imagine Gaza is under the poverty rate? Most of uh, the population are uh, very, very poor. Uh, they have any kind of income. Uh, but on the other hand, we pay too much money to, uh, to buy goods uh, because uh, we pay three kinds of taxes. We pay for Hamas, for PA, and for uh, Israel. And for all that, for all that, you receive almost nothing. We have talked about this before too. That, that, for example, Hamas would not be the government today because they do nothing for the people. They are supported by outside money that wants to put a thorn in the side of Israel. They're doing very well at that, I'm sorry to say. The people of Gaza are paying, as you say, three kinds of taxes and therefore very high prices for every little thing that goes with survival. And, and for what? In exchange for what? You seem to get nothing for it. This is how urgently Western governments need to change their policies if they truly believe in democratic and human values. Uh, we have to summarize all of these things in one word. We have to call it corruption. Uh, what we have here is corruption. Uh, uh, we are very, very poor people uh, surviving without uh, any kind of income, and we are paying three taxes. So uh, everything here is expensive. Uh, and unfortunately, this is corruption, you know, and we are suffering from this corruption. And you, uh, mentioned, you mentioned to me also that, for example, the EU, the uh, European Economic Union, sends money to the Palestinian Authority, the PA, but they do not bother to account for the money and how the money is distributed and spent. And so all kinds of corruption creep in and most of the support for the people that this is intended to bring never reaches the people. It's like, well, it is. You, you're, the Palestinians are trapped between all these different corruptions and so-called authorities that do nothing for them. All the European Union's money are being looted by those uh, corrupted people, by those corrupted politicians. You know, uh, European Union every, every year uh, sends uh, hundreds of millions of euros and dollars uh, we uh, doesn't see anything here. We haven't we haven't any projects, any uh, improvement in the uh, infrastructure and in the social life. We we doesn't see anything because all of these money are going to the bank accounts of those thieves who are looting uh, the European uh, millions. Unfortunately, I am sure. I am sure. 100% sure that Europeans uh, are knowing this very well. But uh, I don't know, but I don't know why they doesn't interfere to, uh, to, uh, to make like boycotts for those uh, corrupted politicians to interfere in any way to solve this problem. I don't know why they keep silent and, uh, and keep sending more and more money. Well, maybe something of that can be answered as we talk about Shireen Abu Akla and her terrible murder on May 15th, I believe it was. It's uh, almost three weeks 
since that event happened. And she was at that time and is now 47, but she was the 46th journalist killed by Israeli forces since the year 2000. 46 journalists in 22 years. And perhaps there's some kind of connection in that it seems that anybody who tries to tell the truth about what is happening ends up silenced or excluded or dead. I, I only share up front uh, for listeners and for your discussion that well, the New York Times published a major editorial about this killing. They were very careful to say, we don't know who killed her. We don't know. It might have been Palestinians also, as well as a, perhaps an Israeli sniper. But they say, we must investigate because an investigation that is fair and honest and, and transparent is important to any democracy. And I, I had to smile because what are you talking about democracy? Half of the people who live in Palestine-Israel are not free. They have second-class rights. They are discriminated against in every way. So if CNN is able to prove through their study of the videotapes of that day around Ms. Abu Akla that it was definitely an Israeli sniper who was taking shots at her, this, this has gone on. I have already heard the phrase, enough is enough. If you remember in 2018, during the March of Return from uh, Gaza that was trying to cross over the border fence and there were many journalists shot there, children, women, and a young woman named, age 21, named Razan Al-Najjar, who was shot dead while trying to help wounded people there. Always the, the beautiful young woman pays the price of trying to tell the truth with a compassionate heart to everyone. So I, I, am, I always have to come back to think that as we see more and more every day, apartheid is a million forms of murder, a million different forms of murder, but it can never, apartheid can never make Israel legitimate. It can never make Israel a democracy. So the increasing hatred and violence, marches shouting death to Arabs, I think this is desperation. What we are seeing is that they know that so much injustice cannot possibly solve the problems or deceive the world. And so they are always more and more angry, afraid, and desperate to put down the people that they are controlling. This is how I have felt so angry since Shireen's murder. And uh, I know the world would love to hear your opinion and what you hear from Palestinian people living in Gaza about it. Anything at all, Mohammed, that you'd like to share? Uh, you know, uh, Israel is all, always are killing and murdering with a cold blood. Uh, always they are committing uh, crimes against uh, uh, journalists, doctors, nurses, uh, ambulance mm -hmm. drivers. Uh, we have uh, hundreds of uh, journalists who, who were killed in the previous years, in the Second Intifada and in the uh, last uh, uh, maybe a couple or three of years, uh, especially when we had the Great March of Return uh, on the borders of Gaza. Uh, Shireen Abu Akla is not the, the first journalist who was killed by the snipers of, of IDF, course. the Israeli army. Uh, she was uh, not the, the first one, and uh, she will not be the last one. You know, uh, We have, as I told you, hundreds of journalists who were killed. Maybe Shireen uh, took a lot of uh, uh, light and uh, too much people uh, spoke about her maybe because she uh, was working with a famous uh, channel uh, yes. which is Al Jazeera yes. uh, maybe other uh, maybe other colleagues uh, for Shireen were killed in uh, in the shade in the shadow you know yes. they, uh, they they didn't they didn't take too much light or bright or uh, uh, like uh, too much people spoke about them 
because they were working with uh, a humble uh, channels or radio stations or websites, etc. Uh, so Shireen was not the first uh, one. I will uh, remind the people, the people who are watching us, I will remind them with, with the American journalist, Mary Calvin, who was killed in Aleppo, the, the, the Syrian uh, city. Uh, Mary Calvin uh, was killed by a Syrian sniper. Uh, exactly the same uh, situation of Shirin Abu Akla. In that time, all the American uh, media, uh, New York Times, uh, CNN, and other media used uh, to wage uh, uh, like uh, a campaign, a heavy campaign against the Syrian regime and the Syrian state in that time accusing the Syrian army of violating the human rights uh, uh, and uh, 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 violating the, the international law, etc. Uh, but unfortunately now we have a double standard policy. Uh, uh, the same media, the same American media uh, doesn't uh, give the same uh, issue the same attention. Shireen was killed also by a sniper, Israeli sniper, but they doesn't uh, give it the, the same uh, attention when and, they and, talk and, about uh, they are hoping, miracle. They are hoping that the problem will go away. They are hoping that people will forget. Great journalist Abby Martin, who uh, created the Empire Files, many very serious programs looking at Israel and the Gaza situation. Yesterday at a news conference, she confronted American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. And she said, what about Shireen Abu Akhla's killing? You say that you support democracy in Ukraine and all over the world, but you do nothing for the Palestinian people. The reportage from CNN carefully studied and determined that it was an Israeli sniper. What are you going to do to make these people accountable for a murder? And he, he, all he did was say basically nothing. We're looking into it. We will investigate. We will study the problem. And this is all they ever do. They just let it hang until the world moves on. But I just want to add quickly, this is why we ask people in our program notes here at YouTube, if you look down under show more, we're always urging people to write to their political representatives, whether it's in the EU or the United States or anywhere around the world, that policies about the Palestinians must be changed. This is 75 years of outrageous human injustice that, that has to be changed and that nothing, no country calling itself a democracy can hide from this any longer. Is there a feeling in Gaza among the people, Mohammed, that with Shireen's death, though, that somehow enough is enough? Do people feel angry enough to begin to become active? What do you think is going to happen next? Uh, before that, I will uh, talk about something important. Uh, in fact, the murder of Shireen Abu Akla uh, has proof that both of us, Muslims and the Christians in Palestine, both of us, are uh, victims for the same enemy, for the same occupation. So both of us are being targeted by the same occupation. There is no difference between Muslim person or Christian persons. Uh, both of us are targeted. Both of us are victims for the same uh, uh, brutal uh, occupation. Uh, in fact, the, bl the, blood, the, the blood of Shirin Abu Akla reminds us with the uh, early Christians in Palestine here, you know Palestine was the cradle of Christianity. The blood of Shireen is reminding us with Stephanus. Stephanus was the first martyr yes, in the history Stephen. of Christianity. He was killed and stoned by the Jews here in Palestine. Also here blood is reminding us with Saint Valentina. Saint Valentina was a good Christian virgin woman. She was killed by the pagans and she was 
burnt in fire because she because she refused to pray for the pagan Lord and she insisted to be a follower for Jesus the Christ. So uh, the blood of Shirin Abu Akla is, unifi is unifying us as a Palestinians, one by one, side, side by side, shoulder and shoulder, Muslims and the Christians in Palestine. Both of us, we have the same destiny facing this uh, occupation. Uh, here in Gaza, uh, as you know, uh, exactly like in West Bank, like in Jerusalem, like all the Palestinians, even in the diaspora, uh, here, here in Gaza, uh, all of people uh, felt sorrow and felt sad for the brutal murder of Shireen. We had marches, we had uh, some sort of strike, uh, too much people, uh, felt as uh, I told you, sad. Uh, some poets wrote poems for her soul. Uh, some people made some uh, drawings, some uh, arts, some, uh, some photos for her because uh, they considered her as a, as a champion or a hero. She used to, uh, to be killed during her coverage for her holy job. You, you, you know, uh, to be a, you, you know to, to be a journalist is to be a holy uh, person because you are uh, conveying a holy message. You know, you, so you think, all, all the people here. I'm sorry, go yeah. ahead. So, so all the people here used to consider her as a hero, and they uh, followed on the TV her funeral and her and her burial. Uh, and uh, as I told you, uh, Gaza was very, very uh, sad in that black day. Do you think that when people are saying enough is enough, do you think the next step will be toward some kind of more violence or war? Or do you think it will be toward more demonstrations like the March of Return in 2018, which was a very peaceful demonstration to the world that these people are prisoners. Two and a half million people are being held captive and collectively punished for no monstrable reason. Which way do you think it will go? Will the, Palestine, will the Palestinians struggle more in a combative way or will they try to demonstrate their unity in peaceful ways? Uh, frankly, I cannot predict what would happen in the coming months I don't know uh, whether we are going to make a new military uh, action or we are going again to make peaceful demonstrations uh, on the borders. I cannot predict. Uh, these uh, weeks, we have a calm situation here in Gaza uh, because people are exhausted by the economical uh, crisis and the very, very uh, tough uh, siege. People became very, very uh, tired, and we have too much people are committing suicide. Just uh, uh, if you want to speak about the recent two weeks, we have more than five cases of uh, suicide. Some of people used to burn themselves. Some of people used to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to take poison, like, like tablets or capsules. Some people used to jump from uh, high uh, floors. Uh, we have uh, maybe more than five cases uh, just in the uh, just in the last two weeks, you know. Uh, so I cannot predict, but we have to keep uh, following up and watching what will happen. Okay, uh, you asked me today to manage our time a little bit. I think if anybody saw our last program when the electricity in your batteries was running out, uh, we basically ran out of time to do some of our other uh, purposes. So we would like to finish today with going back one program. We were talking about the Palestinian heritage, how ancient it is and how rich it is. And there were some ways that needed to be said still to connect the ancient history of Palestine with right now. What is it going to mean for 
for us right now? How can it guide us now? So with your permission, I'd like to talk about that for a couple of minutes and we'll see where we arrive at. As I mentioned, last time we were detailing some of the proofs from science and archeology, span the connections between the Southern Mediterranean peoples, the post Minoans, the Cretans, and the foundations of Palestine itself. These relationships between Mediterranean peoples and the Canaanites of the Palestinian area were rooted in trade for many centuries, wine, oil, they were even hiring out Minoan painters to come to many of the houses along the seacoast of the Near East and paint beautiful pictures on the walls for the elite of those communities. Those relationships always everywhere lead to family relationships, kinship. People get married, they fall in love with his daughter or her son, and they form family relationships that police the rules of trade. If you cheat me in a business, my mother will come after you. <laughs> if I cheat you, your brother will come and visit me and we'll have to settle up. We don't need police, we don't need wars, we don't need armies because we are family together and we keep our civilization organized in that way. And the first immigrants from the Sea Peoples era, from the Mediterranean, were combining all these things, Canaanite ways, Cretan ways, Mycenaean mainland Europe ways, peoples of the sea also brought many of their characteristics to this land. Everybody, you could say, brought something to the feast. This is what archaeology is telling us, that you have many temple sites that give us physical evidences of Canaanite people being there and Philistine people being there and Mycenaeans being there, all with their different traditions, but mixing them together very successfully. So the first question becomes, with what results? See, the Philistines came into Palestine because Egypt was weak. Egypt had exhausted itself in wars against the Hittites. The Battle of Kadesh, 1274, had exhausted both those great empires. And then the Egyptians were attacked by the Sea Peoples. And when the defeated Philistines were moved from their capture in Egypt to what would become Palestine, they were set to work as guardians of the trading roads, the great roads that run along the Near Eastern coastland and up through the mountains in which Jerusalem stands, that connected the Near East with Babylon, with Aram Damascus, with Nineveh, with Ur, and with many countries, including Sri Lanka, as we know from physical proofs, uh, that fed a tremendous amount of wealth into Egypt at that time. So the wealth that's coming into Egypt at the time, of a scholar named Itamar Singer detailed a lot of this. This suggests that the Philistines were very successful at their work at allowing and helping the caravans of trade to pass safely from the Far East to the Mediterranean shores where Gaza and Ascalon and Ashdod and Dor and Aphek and all these other cities of Philistine communities were thriving. So at the same time they were successful, the Philistines at guarding those rivers of trade for Egypt, they were extending their own trade on, in both directions and they were creating their own communities. There's a guy named Trude Dothan who has documented a lot of Philistine history and says that they began as farmers, then they became tradesmen and workers, then they became artisans and political figures, religious figures, they had a developing civilization there. Now, if all of this was working without major wars or even with famous kings, even with the mid-country Hebrews who shared many of the social and religious ways with Palestine, why couldn't the high country Israelites get along with them too? There's an archeologist named Ann Killebrew who points out that the Highland Israelites did not even interact almost at all with their fellow Hebrew tribes in the middle of the country. Apparently the Israelite ideology was all about separation. You will not, as you see in the Bible, you will not feast with them. You will not eat food together with them under their roof. You will have no treaties with them, you will not marry with them. And so as troubles began, all these different ways that 
preserve the peace among peoples were not allowed anymore. And once people stop talking to each other, war is never far behind. Now, you would think that the Israelites and the Philistines could coexist. They were both very loose tribal confederacies. They both had bad experience with Egypt. They both really disliked the ideas of kings. And they were both developing, as I said, their own communities. So what was at stake? Was it culture? Was it religion? No. It was control of the roads of trade. If the Philistine role was to facilitate the passage of the caravans, bringing the wealth from the east to Egypt and back the other way, the Israelites early on must have either opposed it, stopped it, or interfered with it somehow. Because as the Bible says itself, at that time, each man was a law unto himself. So eventually war broke out. Philistines had a few major victories and then some major defeats, but they were not broken. They withdrew, they assimilated into the Canaanite population, and this gave us the kingdom of Israel, which was very short-lived, a couple of hundred years. And what was the result of that? Well, the leading archaeologist of Israel today, Israel Finkelstein, wrote a book, and he has shared with us that an Egyptian pharaoh Sheshon the first smashed into Israel and the whole region to clear the roads of trade. Egypt, when they came back with a vengeance to destroy and to pillage and everything, they always did it because they were clearing the roads of trade with the Far East. That's where their great wealth was coming from. So finally, if we have then a vastly documented early Palestinian civilization, it predates by a long time the first outside mention of Israel around 1210 BC. But that those people lose their title to the land because they were conquered by the Israelites. Then why does Israel retain and demand its exclusive historical right to the land now? When ancient Israel too had been conquered and destroyed. So you see the fatally flawed unscientific and unjust not logic that drives the violent desperation of Zionist Israel now. The core struggle of Israel is for legitimacy. Apartheid, as we said, cannot fake it, cannot force legitimacy. That can only come from a just sharing of the land that truly reflects that land's human history. So it's interesting, the Balfour Declaration tells us in two paragraphs what the stakes are. Legitimacy of Israel rests with the Palestinians. So it's time for everybody to bring something to the feast. If we all want to live well, we have to give up these prejudices and learn to live together as all of our ancestors once did. So I welcome your comment. That's all I have to say for today. I wanted very much for people to understand not only the details of Palestinian ancient history, but what it means for us now. And it has, it has a lot to teach us. They were very wise people. Yes, brother. Uh, I agree with you. You uh, gave very, very wonderful uh, information about the ancient history of Palestine. Of course, I agree with you. Uh, Palestine has a very rich uh, history uh, from uh, prehistory era uh, coming to the Bronze Age, to the Iron Age, then to the Roman era, Byzantium era, Islamic era, etc. Right now, uh, Palestine uh, has a very, very rich uh, history uh, full of uh, invasions, battles, conquests, uh, you know, and also Palestine, uh, according to its important uh, location, if you want to speak uh, geographically, Palestine uh, is a, a bridge between uh, Asia and Africa. Uh, it always know. has been. Yes, yes. So if you want to speak about uh, Palestine as a location, its location is very, very important uh, from a geostrategic uh, way. Also, so, Palestine has a very 
very extended and uh, rich uh, history. Yeah. So in closing here, our time is running out for today. But I think it's important that people realize that this is why so many peoples, plural peoples, want the land and feel so attached to it. They have a very ancient heritage there. The only legitimate state that can now organize and control that land must be a just one. It must answer to all the different people's histories on that land. Exactly. Let me just clarify one, one important point. Yes, quickly, because I, I think the time is about yeah, to go, yeah. so go quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me tell you that the two uh, Israeli uh, kingdoms, uh, Yehuda and Samaria, both of them, as you just mentioned, uh, have lasted two centuries, and uh, both of them were uh, located on a uh, very, very small part from the Palestinian land, not, not spreading all over the Palestinian geography. That's so right. we, have to, uh, we have to explain this important uh, point also. Yes, yes. brother. Yes. Yes, there is, there is no historical claim by the Israelites or Hebrews on the coastal territories, especially. The archaeology yeah, completely yeah, yeah. supports the Palestinian possession of those territories. Exactly, and... exactly. Exactly. The two kingdoms lived very short age. Also, uh, their area was very limited, was not covering all the Palestinian geography at all. It was inland, yes, to the east. Exactly, exactly inland, far from the sea. So, Mohammed, I would, I would like to thank you so before, so we don't get cut off. I just, I want to thank you again for a wonderful conversation. And I know that your audience will really appreciate everything you have to share. We'll look forward to much more next time. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Thank you, brother. Uh, we are going to uh, make new episodes from this program to clarify more and more for uh, the people who are watching and following. Okay, well, we all wish you very well, your wonderful family and everybody in Gaza and in Palestine. Justice will come. And we urge you to keep a strong heart and a healthy body and a healthy mind. And for all the difficulties, we will see this through together, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Bye-bye until next time.